It's great to be with you all. I My last lecture I gave for you was on bathing suits, and that was quite a bit fun. And I really enjoyed being there with all the group. Uh, that was about three years ago. Uh, those items are now at History Miami, where I was curator when I was 22 years old. And um, they have been the recipient of all my uh, major collections. Um, I've been actually working on this piece on Abiyaka. Uh, this is just a little part of it, but for 50 years, these people that are on the screen right now are two of my best friends from long ago. Um, Bobby Henry is the rainmaker that he's known well worldwide and uh, Alan Jumper and they're at Smallwood store in Chukaluski. Abiyaka was the great Oh, I just, excuse me, just a second. I see something that's a problem. Can these go away on the side or no? Um, I don't know if you can. Okay. I it doesn't matter. I can fudge it. All right. Okay. Peter, um, it's actually one of the more recent pieces of, of um, history that I've underturned. Looks to me like he was probably trained in a Tamukwin actual sorcerer school. And he came to prominence during the lengthy Second Seminole War, 1835 to 1842. And he lived after the war until post-war 1869, which means since he was a major leader that controlled the, the cultural way, um, its probability is great that he actually was able to put the culture back into a system where they could continue to today, let's say, um, because they had um, been dispersed for so many years during the wars that they needed to come back together and reformulate their culture as it was before, because they were very strict about that. Um, and the more recent work, um, Abiyaka are saying and ethnohistorically interpret the impact of Abiyaka during the war as the native religious-based military tour de force against the might of the leading world power, the United States. That was quite a big, a big job to jump up to, to that uh, bit um, when you're a native tribe in a new area of Florida. It was the Miccosukee speaking people, the Ilaplanathi, documented by Hernando de Soto as early as 1540 recognized through centuries by their distinct language and their proactive demeanor in the protection of their tribal sovereignty. Their leaders, the Capechiquis, whose names reflected their great time depth to that 19, uh, 1540 town, were voted by council to command the field in America's aggressive First Seminole War, while Sam Jones successfully then led the Second Seminole War, 1835 to 1842, with his seasoned leaders and young within with all of the leaders dead or captured by the Third Seminole War beginning in 1855, Jones pulled back into the Florida wilderness, becoming the protector of the clan's gene pool. And in that respect, he was most successful. The Seminole tribe of Florida in the 1950s was poor as were all tribes across Indian America. But in 1979, the initial economic venture of the Seminole tribe of Florida under Chairman Jibes into the tax-free gaming economy in 1979, creating an economic boon beyond anyone's imagination. This venture also launched the Miccosukee tribe of Indians of Florida, and in fact, poverty-stricken tribes across Indian America. In the broad view, post-wartime Florida Seminole history is Miccosukee history uh, by numbers though it's not been until now received as an in-depth study and interpretation. History Miami at 100 Flagler Plaza will be opening my 500 square foot exhibition in April, 2022, we're hoping. So it looks like it will be. Um, I'm trying to switch to my slide number two. Here? Okay. 
The Miccosukee culture originated historically in the southeastern culture area, seen here in red. Anthropologists denote culture areas of tribe and as in Europe, Africa, and other countries, it's the language that establishes, in this case, a singular tribal identity. And that's what Ilapashnichathi means, people who speak the language. This bust of Sam Jones, bronze by Cooley, is the most popular representation of the great Miccosukee leader of whom we have no photos at all. Um, he was the strategist, the cultural hero, commissioned, uh, this statue was commissioned by, um, and the Seminole Tribal Council in the latter 1990s. Abiyaka was the religious head of the Miccosukee before the Second Seminole War in 1835, and by 1937, after Jones's major coup to defeat a sizable move of Miccosukee people to Indian Territory, today's Oklahoma, by the American military, Jones was elected to the Grand War Chief position, a seldom precedented status at the head of the Seminole tribes fighting in Florida. Not really a poly scholarly works have proliferated, majoritively the Miccosukee speakers with some Alachua speakers and refugee Creeks from Alabama, and a small percentage of free and runaway African slaves from Southern and Florida plantations. A new and very important segment of the tribal data is that the Miccosukee were first documented in written history, as I mentioned, by the Spanish explorer Hernando de Soto, who landed in Tampa Bay in, a, in 1537. And in 1540 in Greater Peninsula, Florida, he found the people who would later be known as Miccosukee in the town of Capechequi. De Soto's chroniclers noted that the people of Capechequi spoke a language unintelligible to the tribes around them. This more than any other description shows the Capechequians as a separate tribal entity from their neighbors, setting them apart as a singular tribal people. And this research coupled with important oral history collected by the Work Progress Administration on an Oklahoma Oma Reservoir with Miccosukees removed there from Florida during the Seminole Wars, establishes important Florida tribal history. Those uh, Work Progress Administration pieces related that the adventuresome splinter group from Capechiqui came dubbed the Miccosukee or Hog Kings upon a refer return visit to their town when they excitedly told that where they now lived, presumably near the Flint and Chattahoochee rivers in today's West Georgia, the hogs were as numerous as alligators. And what that means to us is the European origin passel of hogs were the result of um, when Hernando de Soto came up that way, their, their droves of hogs would get loose. And historically, from then on, the Miccosukee, who were extremely proactive in their cultural affairs, are easier to trace by name in the 18th and 19th century historical records of the Spanish and of the British, with whom the Miccosukee fought as allies for war honors and fantastic trade goods as well, when they ruled Florida in 1763 through 1784, or notably in 1812 and 1814. So this period of time was absolutely full of Miccosukee history. And the Miccosukees are the largest speaking group of Native Americans in Florida. Impacting the Northeast Indian tribes and soon affecting the many Southeastern tribes as well was the predominantly coastal dwelling American colonists encroachment into Native Indian lands. A native traded by uh, actually Tecumseh's brother, Testank Tatawa, and Tecumseh then, who was the speak speaker of that movement, um, a spiritualist from the Great Lakes Shawnee tribe. And this etching depicts Tecumseh's speech to arouse the Creeks at a well attended gathering in Alabama in, Alabama in 1811. 
a major and dedicated faction, the nativistic Red Stick Creeks, went to war against the American settler, Venge, on defenseless folks sheltering at Fort Mims. Tennessee and Andrew Jackson was then placed at the head of the American troops, engaging the Creeks at Horseshoe Bend in, Atlanta, in Alabama, March 27, 1814. Quelling the Red Stick movement cost the Creek Nation 23 million acres of land in forfeit. The Creek Council from then on attempted to fly under the radar and pacify the Americans. Under the teachings of their new, they took up settlers' ways. They started carting and spinning, pinning their stock up, abstaining from the hunt and any other of their outward native ways. They were trying to be good citizens so they wouldn't be removed to Indian territory west of the Mississippi River, which became, of course, the general fate of the Indians in the Southeast. Finding that munitions had been supplied to the upper creeks from Spanish Florida, uh, Janet J Jackson's armies invaded the weekly garrison at Pensacola. President Monroe had sent a letter to Jackson noting the great advantages in the future if he engaged in a quote, movement against the Seminoles. And indeed other prongs of Jackson's army engaged the native Florida tribes at Miccosukee, the largest town in Florida, uh, east of Tallahassee and at other towns as far south as Alachua in today's Gainesville where I am. Then he hung two British subjects as spies who had indeed enabled the Miccosukees with guns and supplies. And Jackson faced serious charges in Washington for his brash invasion of Spanish Florida. However, the United States gained Florida real estate via the strengths and weaknesses of international politics. But the Florida territory came with 6,000 Indian inhabitants. What to do? Mikosuke town had been destroyed. Old Capachimico sacrificed his life on the battlefield and Capachimico Kanachi, his name reflecting great time death back to the 1540 DeSoto contact town had a long history of diplomacy celebrated leader. He, four chiefs and 23 others were given the council's mandate. This is their tribal council where they decide all the laws to travel to Nassau or Jamaica, the closest English ports of call, to ask the authorities as a patriot of England, having fought repeatedly with his men as British allies, to contact their good King George for aid. They left Tavernier on the ship Primrose, arriving in Nassau September 29th. Actually, no aid was forthcoming. Um, because by then, of course, the England had been thoroughly whipped by the U.S., but by good graces of the Bahamas government, um, William Versey Munnings, the governor, they were given tons of supplies and more than ample funds to return home, but there was no home to return to. It seems highly probable that they were dropped with their gifts of 2,000 pounds of goods and ample coin in the area of Upper Biscayne Bay, in other words, the Upper Biscayne Bay, as well as into the 20th century, um, there was a, an island there still noted on maps uh, up Snake Creek, and it was called Tuscane's Island. And we know that Tuscanija was Kanaji's designated heir. Most fortunately, none of the four chiefs and 23 attendants uh, on the trip to Nassau were identified in any extant uh, documents. However, I've often wondered if one of them might have been Sam's noted that, quote, crossing salt water made him sick. Unfortunately, I've located no records whatsoever concerning Kanaji's people from that point. We consider him to have been um, deceased and um, he probably just lived at uh, Snake Creek and passed away there. Uh, we don't really know. I wish we did. Maybe we'll find out. Archaeological evidence has also not been successful in verifying and dating the early Miccosukee settlement presence in the Everglades in real. They literally, religiously, swept their island settlements daily, sweeping the debris off into the water. 
And they did that the whole time they lived on those islands until around 1900. Next, we know um, that most sailors and city folk at the state, to the, to, when you mentioned the Everglades to them, it was considered odious and frightening while superstitions abounded. Yet British records from 1822, William Cooley, an early settler on New River in 1827, that did explore of the Everglades, John Lee Williams in 1828, and Dr. John Strobel in 1829, all contribute firsthand accounts that verify the presence of the Miccosukee's permanent settlements at home on islands in the Everglades interior. And when I say Miccosukee, I'm speaking in the context of an anthropologist. If I speak in the context of people, I will say two thirds of the Seminole tribe and one third, or I'm sorry, and the Indians of Florida, just so we know who we're talking about. Two thirds of the Seminole tribe of Florida and all of the Miccosukee tribe originally by heritage spoke the language Miccosukee. And knowing that these people are already in the Everglades at those early dates in the 1820s, we can forever get rid of that. They were pushed into the Everglades by the might of the American sources out of our heads because they were already there. And of course that statement historical book as well. It wasn't until September 1823 that the Indians in Florida, identified by American policy under the genetic term Seminoles, were ordered by the US government to convene for the Treaty of Moultrie Creek near St. Augustine. Since several tribal factions were involved for the first time in such a meet, they required a spokesman. Significantly, they reached out and elected the chief Nimathla, we've not heard about before, and history really didn't either seedings. And we wonder who he was. Well, he was a Hitchiti. A Hitchiti is a language that scientists have, linguists have noted, was very similar to the Miccosukees. And his lineage too was from a DeSoto era, era town in Georgia that was labeled Hitchiti. With such an analysis, we can now see him as an Ilaposhni Chathi, who the Miccosukees um, in Miccosukee speak, that means that they speak the language of language and have the same linguistic heritage. And that in fact is why he was selected to lead up those people. America's initial plan following the first Seminole War, 1817 to 1818, was to place the dispossessed Florida Indians and Creek refugees on an interior reservation away from possible interaction or support from the Spanish or at Cuba or the British at Nassau, such as munitions, foodstuffs, and cloth. Our new Florida real estate and decided what to do with the natives. A popular thought in America was to utilize temperate Florida for growing commodities like coffee and sugar, which were then represented, uh, they were represented very expensive imports. Unfortunately, the Indians who did move to the reservation were soon in a desperate situation from starvation as the promised provisions from the government were not forthcoming. And by 1924, America had placed the Indians Indians in the hand and gradually the lands to the west of the Mississippi did become known as Indian territory and Indian removal became imminent. The Miccosukee people as a whole did not live within the reservation, but in their long inhabited island complexes south of Lake Okeechobee in the Everglades. Abiyaka was doc documented in 1828 by the first Florida historian John Lee Williams, a personal friend. We know that Abiyaka and his wife's complex in the Western Everglades that had seemingly a long settlement history for the Everglades, or for the Miccosukee. So we really think that there is little chance that they weren't in the Everglades earlier than even we thought. That complex of islands was connected by small caravanserai islands to other complexes in the Eastern Everglades, seen here. Um, Pine Island is, I can't point to it exactly, but it's in the upper left hand 
end of the map. It's that you see, and I and James Billy, the chairman of the Seminole tribe, and Tina Osceola of the Seminole tribe, whose grandfather had been born on that island, successfully fought in 1989 to preserve Pine Island just before it was getting ready to be developed by Sea Ranch Lakes, who developed the perimeter. They could come all the way up to the uh, drip line of the trees, and I wish we had fought to get them back farther, but it's okay. It's weathered in just fine. And Tina's grandmother called Yatalai, which is a beautiful name. That's the name of Pine Island. And today you can visit it, and I wish you would, please. It can be entered through Treetops Park off of Griffin Road. You head west off I-95 or the Turnpike, and you can get there. Walk Pine Island, I dare you, barefoot, as I did one of the last times I was there. But this map uh, it spans the time depth of the 19th to the 20th century. The Southeast Coast Ridge activity, the white denotes dry land and gray, the former Everglades before drainage. Pine Island is west of New River. Big City Island is where Dania Reservation is today. And um, Chido Tastanugi's Island, or Jones Alachua uh, Seminole Lieutenant, married Jones's wife's clan, and they started another town division and lived at basically Snake Creek at Chido's Island. And, six and, a, and that's where I also estimated that Kanaji and his crew were landed from Nassau in 1819, somewhere within that area. This is a close up of Pine Island complex, um, which like I said, was one of Sam Jones's homes during the second Seminole War. Long Key to the West uh, was actually called um, Sam Jones Seven Islands. And today it's Long Key Natural Area and Nature Center, which you can also visit. This now my grandmother who was born in Little River, Miami in 1888, told me about Pine Island Every time we drove out Snake Road, uh, State Road 84, at the top of the photo, you can see State Road 84, now today 595. But because the area around Pine Island was agricultural up to the 70s, as seen here, I had never seen it. Absolutely never. It was like just a myth. You know, she'd wave. It's over there, you know. So at two and a half miles long and 29 feet feet above Fort Lauderdale, Pine Island is the highest point in Broward County. And it was created as an anomaly when the ocean waters receded off the Florida landmass. Today, it stretches from I-595 to Orange Avenue with Treetops Park at the bottom. But this is as I saw Pine Island in the latter 1980s as I flew to Fort Lauderdale International Airport with uh, Sea Ranch Lakes up at the top, you know, ruined the whole green area. Um, I had with me the copies of the historic survey maps from 1898 in my luggage. Um, so this was this was awesome, and I'm sure I yelled out and thank goodness it was in the days before hijacking, or would it, they would have thought I was, uh, you know, in need of something. Um, but. When I actually visited the island for the first time, it was the most unique thing uh, because that hill, the, the 29 foot hill, it was so high. And, and in Fort Lauderdale, it was just awesome. Uh, there was still a family of um, African-American field hands living in a shanty town in an oak grove at the bottom. Um, so field work had not been far off. And my dear friend, Thomas Storm, Otter Clan, poses here during one of the commemorative events at the statue of William Lauderdale, rather politically incorrect, commissioned by Forrest Ridge at Pine. But anyway, we held a number of events there. Uh, the Seminole tribe countered this statue by ordering a bonds by Cooley statue of Sam Jones, aiding a woman and her child to escape. And it was dedicated at Treetops Park on September 16th, 1995, which is the public entrance to Pine Island, uh, now a Broward County Park. 
To assure Pine Island's preservation, I involved the Seminole Tribe of Florida and Lawson and Recreational Lands Committee, CARL, with tribal citizen Tina Marie Osceola, whose grandfather, as I mentioned, had been born in a big town's camp on the island. They also had the corn dance grounds on the island, and that was another major reason that I was able to get it um, preserved. Um, it was hard to get individual Miccosukee people at that time to sign my petition, as my older friends were still bound as a carryover from the war period, never to sign documents. Data and historic photographs of the religious ceremonial grounds from the Stranahan collection that were housed at Fort Lauderdale Historical Society. The preservation of the island was assured and was dedicated in 1989 with Governor Martinez on the podium. Um, and recently today, Tina Marie Osceola, after serving this project and other major cultural positions, has accepted the position as the director of the Seminole Tribe of Florida's TIPO. Historically proud of her for that. Six miles to the southeast in the Everglades, close to Miami, Seafort Dallas, was Hido Chastanugi's Island, which my research preserved several years later. And this is actually where Chitto and his family lived. Uh, it's absolutely beautiful. A friend of mine was just there, David Ratterman. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous site. Um, the county has done so well with it. Uh, it had been a private residence, but on acreage. And they elements, and um, that's where Sam Jones' wife's family formally divided, as I mentioned. And Shido lived there with about 80 families that were allied to Jones during the war. This is a horrible sketch, but one that I did have of Chitto, who had become Jones's war chief in the latter years of the Second Seminole War. To give some idea of the serenity and vastness of the Eastern Everglades, this is an airboat water trail. The old days, of course, this would have been a trail for the Miccosukee's large, and I mean huge, cypress dugout canoes. Back upstate, where most people reckon with South Florida, they don't know what it's like. Um, but back upstate, with the Florida Indians residing basically in the hands of the military and, on, and it, with Indian removal now a definite fact. It wasn't long before Camp King near Ocala became Fort King. Abiyaka coming watched it all. And by the way, Fort King is in the process of being recreated to a certain extent today. The site is definitely there where you could visit. From two corroborating accounts at both Camp King here and at Fort Brook, which looks kind of simple, similar in, in Tampa Bay, and there was a road between them, we find mention of an old crusty Indian. Most of the enlisted men and even officers were a good deal younger. So this guy was considered ancient. And this Indian looked for the officer's mess. And again, the officers were generally from genteel backgrounds. So they were very glad to get the fish. They were always good for his news. And he collected intel like crazy and um, you know all about the influx of troops and the latest scuttlebutt from Washington to aid his cause. And that man, obviously in disguise, has been identified positively by both General George McCall and a surgeon, Abiyaka, the spy. There's a book there. Now President Andrew Jackson's Indian Removal Bill was presented at the Treaty of Payne's Landing in May of 1832. It stipulated that one third of the Florida Indians would leave for Arkansas every year and would become part of the Creeks. The Creeks were, and in fact still are, considered the enemy by traditional Miccosukee. And this fact added to the fuel of the remain here on the land of Florida. However, there was an important preamble to the removal bill. A delegation of chiefs would have to approve the land. This is John Hicks, a town leader of the Miccosukee who went to Indian territory to access the land as the representative of Sam Jones. 
While in Indian Territory in, my, in March 1933, Hicks and the other representatives were apparently co coerced into signing their approval of the land. Their tribal council. So the document really had no validity and yet Congress approved it. How after two years later in April 1835, when the Fort King Council convened near Ocala, Florida, the idea was that the document had evidently been viewed as suspect enough by the United States government to be put forth for further ratification by the Florida mm -hmm. Indians. But Sam Jones and three other chiefs refused to put their mark on the state's Indian agent Wiley Thompson dramatically struck their names from the official list of chiefs. Later in the discussion, still in a fury, while listening to the continued proceedings, Jones the sorcerer was seen to, to be leaning against the wall and then periodically stamp his feet in anger. Suddenly the high wooden platform with military officers and chiefs alike fell to the ground. It was deemed as a result of Jones the great spiritual matters went from bad to worse a few months later at fort king osceola from a creek refuge family who had grown to manhood in florida had like the mikasuki speakers been thoroughly opposed to being forced to leaving florida and felt the indians should take a firm stand against their forced eviction with those strong ideals of a mikasuki though he was not from a leadership clan osceola and the mikasuki Kwakachi were advanced to least by the Miccosukee hierarchy. In the opening events of the Second Seminole War, Osceola dispatched General Wiley Thompson at Fort King. He also made an example of Charlie and Mathla, who preparing to follow the government's edict and peaceably immigrate to Indian territory, had sold his cattle and took the money. Osceola shot Amathla and threw his coins to the winds. Osceola himself is an interesting subject. His fame from situation made him a meme and his daily known and viably depicted icon of the Florida Seminoles. It's a little known fact, but discussed and corroborated by his contemporary, the historian John Lee Williams, who knew both Jones and Osceola well, that it was Jones and the Miccosukee who advanced Osceola to his position. In fact, William noticed are noted that he was deemed a nobody by the Indians, but as a necessity of war, he was advanced and led notable battles, attesting to his popular war for a mere 18 months before being captured. He was the darling of heroism, captured under the flag of truce. He was a good friend to a lot of the military people and he was transferred to Fort Moultrie, North South Carolina, where he was the most famous person most locals and tourists who visited the South Carolina fort had ever seen, and they came every weekend to see him. Painted in captivity by the most famous American artist, Catlin and Curtis, then dying and dated as a specimen of phrenology, a popular pseudoscience topic of the Victorian era, he created a lasting le le legend for himself. He was indeed an outstanding leader as one of Sam Jones's Tustanagis or lieutenants. His charisma with American military leaders, fancy clothes, his friendly demeanor in times of peace were notable. Why is he so famous? First, the press publicized the fact to the American public that Osceola had been captured by the moon in St. Augustine. Osceola was then well on his way to martyrdom and the Hall of Fame when he was moved to Fort Moultrie. And he exists today really in most exhibits of Seminoles like at the, at the Smithsonian, his is the icon on every exhibit. In the latter 1900s, the late Billy Sipe, well, I'm sorry, with no communications to the North, December 28, 1835. The Miccosukee, always vocal and proactive, were vehemently opposed to leaving Florida, as I've mentioned. 
Their religious political leaders knew that, quote, they would cease to be Miccosukee if they left the land of their religion. In a plan said to have been contrived by Jones, the Miccosukee laid in wait for troops sent north from Fort Brooke, Tampa, to fortify the centralized pre-Second Seminole War hotspot, Fort King at Ocala. And this being by Miami artist Ken Hughes, General Francis L. Dade has just been shot off his horse by the leader of the Miccosukee, Micanope, uh, by the leader of the Miccosukee, Micanope, in the opening volley of the Dade ambush. The Second Seminole War led by the Miccosukee would last until 1842. And interestingly, the Dade ambush took place on the military road within the delineated Indian Reserve. And this is late Billy L. Cypress Bear Clan, co-founder and First Tribes at Tataki Museum. And he is narrating at the just after Christmas um, Dade Battlefield um, presentation, a reenactment uh, still held at the state site of ambush in Bushnell, Florida. Do check though, because I'm not sure if it'll be this year or not. I haven't seen any mention of it. This is Micanopi, who was actually the tutelary leader of the Miccosukee. But he was uh, capitulated early in the war to agree to leave. And that's when 700 of his people and his slaves were gathered at the detention camp. And Sam Jones, Kwakachi, and Osceola, with 200 of their men, liberated the camp in complete silence with Micanopi's life to forfeit if they hadn't. Um, the orchestration of this event was a truly amazing coup for Sam Jones' reputation. General Thomas Jessup had been chagrined, actually, Nobi's family and African slaves to Jones and Osceola at Tampa. Of course, he, he, his job was on the line and he even offered to quit, uh, but they wouldn't take his resignation. Uh, he felt he'd come up with another means to do his duty and eliminate the Seminoles from Florida. Um, he, Kawakachi and Sam Jones, other lieutenant was imprisoned when he came to St. Augustine to visit his father, Philip, incarcerated in the Oli Castillo San Marcos. And these men had come in on really grasping at straws to find out a way to get these men off the field and behind bars. And he did get a, a terrific, a lot of flack about it, but the war was going nowhere and he was to do this uh, <laughs> before the president. This is the Curtis Osceola that was painted of Osceola. And this is Castillo San Marcos, which um, um, uh, the men were kept until they were at And supposedly the window that Kawakachi and other prisoners made their dramatic escape from uh, by taking Indian medicine to shrink their bodies and supposedly crawling through that tiny little window in the ceiling of their prison at the fort. I looked at it about two months ago and I don't know about that, but uh, they, this is a picture that was um, uh, made for an illustration. Um, they supposedly leveraged down the outside at night. <clears throat> and made, I love it. And I loved it as a kid too, but I prefer the less dramatic and more plausible story that I located on Kawakachi, bribing and or both making medicine on the guards and walking out the front gate and riding off on Mariposa, the horse of Mr. Dunham, a resident of St. Augustine. The residents were indeed very fond of the Seminole readers incarcerated at the fort. And the story was told in much later days, born to secrecy, but it really is true. At any rate, the important fact was that Kwakachi was freed and headed straight to Sam Jones. And you can imagine with both of his lieutenants incarcerated, Osceola and Kwakachi, Jones was desperate for new good leadership. And Kwakachi offered him that, offered the movement, that new opportunity and what an opportunity it was. Meanwhile, it was because 
that the ailing Osceola and his family were moved to Fort Moultrie, South Carolina, where he died probably from the complications of malaria and was buried. After Kwakachi escaped from the Castillo, San Jones was more than ready to take on the United States Army. General Jessup's Cherokee negotiators that he had hired in an attempt to persuade Jones to immigrate were sent away, and it ended any hope for peaceful negotiation. 37, the Battle of Okeechobee ensured that in the Army annals, the name of Sam Jones would be remembered as a military strategist. Prior to this, often the Miccosukees fought what the, what the annals would call Fabian strategy, where pitch battles and frontal assaults were avoided in favor of wearing down the opponent, adopted also when there was no feasible alternative strategy that could be devised. The Okeechobee battle was a formal pitch battle. <clears throat> it was Thurlka's reputation. There were 175 Miccosukee on the east side of Kissimmee River near Lake Okeechobee, and they occupied one of the strongest positions, a difficult place to approach or enter via a swamp, which put the advancing US troops, the Tennessee volunteers, in a most hazardous position. Even before they reached firm ground, the military historian John Mann noted, never had Indians prepared a battleground with greater care, while Air Force historian and Philip Tonized a brilliant defense. Sorry, John. It's not wanting to advance for some reason. In this pitched battle, the Miccosukee had cut the grass for firing lines. Men in the trees had notched limbs for their guns. Jones commanded more than half of the 380. Kwakachi was on his left. Jones's prophet of Tulki Taco and Sam Jones could be heard singing their medicine songs to give the warriors courage and stamina that their bullets would hit the mark. The battle raged from 2.30 to 3 p.m. Jones, Alligator, Kowakachi, and their men were outnumbered two to one. But when it was over, their confirmed losses were 11 warriors killed and 14 wounded. While the U.S. under Tennessee volunteers had 26 killed and 100 put out to all surgeons from Tampa. Historian Tucker's opinion is that Jones and his men had inflicted the highest losses on any American force during the Second Seminole War, and one of the highest in the annals of Indian warfare. And this is a painting by our good friend, Jackson Walker. Oh, shoot. John, I'm not getting it again. I... Oh, on here. Okay, sorry. All right. Um, following, sorry about that. Following the Okeechobee and Loxahatchee battles, Jones and his people probably went south down the Caloosahatchee River and into the Okeechobee Slough. Like the Everglades itself, this was an unknown water road feature that I've often called Sam Jones' secret weapon. This strategic inland waterway allowed Jones' rapid, untected movements from the uplands to the Everglades, the eastern beaches, where he spent much time. We'll discuss that later. Sightings of Jones became a foundation of his mystical and uncanny persona and spiritualism. While young Lieutenant Henry Prince, an express rider, apprehensively scanned the forest way to the north around Fort King and wrote, the spirit of Sam Jones pervade the, pervades these woods, if perchance he is not here himself. This is a typical ever glades water. I don't know how to do your This vegetation map from 1947 provides the most accurate illustration of the Everglades and Big Cypress ecosystem, where the pre-war Miccosukee had lived and, and still, still live even today. This inland sea afforded them physical protection from without and sustained them during the Seminole Wars. 
Essentially, what you see here is Sam Jones' pre-war and wartime domain as it was. This was, it was just when the canals were put through, so they hadn't really wreaked all their havoc thus far on the Everglades. Um, and these were the same water roads before the widespread alteration of the latter 20th century in the form of invasive con conservation areas, uh, post-1947 floods and ditching and diking for the widespread cattle and agricultural interests. Fortunately, the high island complexes that Sam Jones made noteworthy, literally along with the smaller caravanserai islands with Miccosukee names that stretch across the Everglades. The major source of resupply for the wartime Miccosukee speakers of Southern Florida that the Everglades could not supply was found in a salvage taken from the wrecked ships or floundering ships during the Seminole Wars, advantageously due to heavy uh, storms, especially in 1937, I'm sorry, 1837, by wrecks just north and south of the Fort Lauderdale Inlet, which was then opened in the area of today's Sheridan Street in Hollywood, for all you Hollywoodians. Uh, it is doubtful that the movement against removal could have succeeded by the natives as it did without this inconceivable bounty of foodstuffs, cloth, and metals, um, including lead, and that there was a significant supply line north. A key point was the rice wreck in 1837 that supplied so many with sustenance. The ship's log book, um, the pretty Marietta was found by the military in a camp, most probably Jones's, because it was in the right area, on the Loxahatchee River near Jupiter Inlet. Because of the volume of Miccosukee wrecking, the U.S. actually established a blockade to stifle this practice in 1838, and that's where they built our Fort Lauderdale out on the beach. Surveyor Marcellus A. Williams' 1870s map shows the location of three Forts Lauderdale. And of course, one of those was the one on the beach. At the very end of 1838 campaign in Florida and during a ceasefire, Lieutenant Colonel William Bankhead in a truly bold mood, move took 400 men and moved to from Fort Lauderdale and 21 boats through the south South Fork of New River, high water had waned and it was only by pushing and pulling the boats that Bankhead's men managed to get near the island. Sentries were in the trees on the periphery, all right, uh, but they didn't see them. Bankhead showed the white flag as a, tr as a truce did exist, but of course the flag was fired on. So the troops took advantage of that situation and a four pound cannon mounted in the bow of one of the boats was loosed on the snipers. The Pine Islanders, and it was learned Jones himself, were caught totally by surprise and fled west, leaving their provisions and lead behind. Really a tough maneuver for Bankhead, and Pine Island would be made a haven through 1841, hopefully with better security. I imagine there were young men in the, in the trees and they'd never seen anything, so they weren't expecting anything. April 1838, in an immediate follow-up in pursuit of Jones, General Jessup ordered Colonel William S. Harney, the great Indian fighter from out west, to again engage the African slave Don Philip to lead to a fast nighttime march down the coast where all the camps were because he had been with um, Kawakachi's father before and he was a major leader. So Harney then utilized canoes to push farther south. And the expedition um, followed John Phillips' intimate knowledge of the Miccosukee speaking people's hunting and gathering areas. Then they went overland across the hazardous coral rock outcroppings um, 20 miles south of Key Biscayne around Cutler, about Cutler's rocks. There they found, finally caught up with and surprised Jones people in a temporary camp. 
the women had gathered in processing Punti root, and the men had been on a deer hunt. And in a heated fight, Jones's loss was again in supplies and gunpowder that was left behind as the camp fled, while Harney's men hunkered down and feasted on their dinner. In a new ploy by the government to end the war, Macomb contrived the Macomb Peace. This was a complicated affair in which the Americans agreed to, lead, to leave the Seminoles in a boundary south of Peace Creek on Florida's west coast. It was unclear if this arrangement was to be permanent, yet the war weary, it seemed very hopeful. Jones, ever cautious, sent Chitto to the conference in his place. However, Sandy Perryman and Samson Forrester, the military connected African interpreters who had been given the responsibility of the leaders, allowed the persons at the meet to believe that Chitto had taken Jones's place as the head of the Miccosukees. This caused knowledgeable eyewitnesses attending the historic conference to rightfully feel that the whole event was just a farce. While the Northern newspapers which I probably should have mentioned before, were keyed into this war like you wouldn't believe. That's where we get some of our best source material. They responded with the headlines of shame, shame. There was 20th, 1839, the Americans issued a general order proclaiming the Second Seminole War <laughs> at an end. <coughs> Jones first met with Lieutenant Colonel William S. Harney at Fort Lauderdale on the beach, directly across from Bahiamar Marina on July 6th, 1839. The conference was covered by an unnamed correspondent from the Journal of Congress, Key West. At this conference, we find Jones, actually, these are the African interpreter's words, which wax a bit Hollywood, but still. Jones said that Harney had never worn two faces with the red men, or spoken with a forked tongue, that the, reds, the, the great spirit had ordained it that he and Harney should meet that day. Jones evidently spoke for an hour with great force and fluency, and at his conclusion, the wars gave a yell of assent that chilled the bud of the stout-hearted colonel, who was attended by only a few officers among the savage. Then on August 13th, 1839, it would appear from the writings of Surgeon Ellen Hughes, stationed at Fort Lauderdale, who became a close friend of Jones, that there was an accord of sorts between the two fighting men, Harney and Jones, during their time at the beachside Fort Lauderdale. In fact, Jones and Harney went up New River on a small steamer just to talk between the two of them, with only the African interpreter, Tony, along to facilitate the conversation. This is the rare relationship of mutual respect between the two men. We wish we had more, but Harney wrote letters to his superior, but did not go into any detail about the conversation. I could wring his neck. Um, but we have Ellis Hughes and his journal to thank for at least this much documentation. These are some artifacts and buttons from the beach fort Lauderdale excavated by local archeologist, Robert S. Carr of the Archeological in Historic 2011. Midi ball and more buttons. Following his conversation on the steamer with Jones, Harney left for the Caloosahatchee River on a very peaceable mission defined by the Macomb Treaty. On this, it was on the site of Dallam Store, a provision of the treaty. It was a trading house that was being set up. As a result, he was given inadequate protection by the military. The location of previous military, military exploration, and it was also south of the formerly active war zone. A major nighttime raid occurred, headed by the heretofore unknown Miccosukee element of, quote, Spanish Indians, long ingrained on the coast and made up of primarily Miccosukee women and their fishermen mates from Cuba, who worked on the ranchos, frontier fish drying areas. The Spanish Indians had long been close to the Alachua Seminole Indians, who had 
settled also following an American a raid decades prior to the Seminole Wars that killed their leader, King Payne, on Payne's Prairie here near present Gainesville. Young Billy Bowlegs, an Alachua Seminole Indian, was now the leader, but totally south of the war zone, they had not been previously involved in the war itself. It was apparent that Harney had been targeted on the treaty store site and was only saved as he had arrived late from Tampa. The majority of his force of dragoons however, won the surprise attack. In a rage, Harney took a steam steamer directly from Fort Lauderdale, uh, I'm sorry, directly to Fort Lauderdale, arriving on August 13th and immediately ordered Jones to appear at a meet in Fort Lauderdale. Jones graciously and over formally, I think, uh, uh, you know, re replied and obliged and came to the meet by canoe. Again, we have another fantastic depiction of this elusive leader. Plain hunting shirt made out of an old sail, which graphically illustrates the wartime shortages. In his hand, he carried a probably damaged but formal calico shirt trimmed with red fringe. On his head, he wore a colored cotton handkerchief in cravat form. It appears significant that Jones overly gave the impression that he came in peace, and perhaps the only time in history he brought with him his entire family, both of his wives, um, son, and two daughters. The reporter for the Key West Floridian noted of the women, the first is about 35 and yet very fair to look upon, and the other is about 16 and very beautiful. Jones named the Spanish Indians as the doubtful culprits, but said basically that he had no jurisdiction over them and noted for the record that they had not been privy to the Macomb Treaty. And so the war was on again. There were before my research, no eyewitness descriptions of Jones. There are now three excellent ones from impeachable, unimpeachable sources located by Boca curator Susan Gillis and my research assistant Rob Maxwell, formerly with Fort Lauderdale Historical. This is a sketch of Jones's nephew, Old Tiger Tail, Kotsahadjo, from the 1870s by artist Charles H. Stevens. I include it because it's my pick. The physical descriptions of nephew Tiger Tail and Uncle Sam Jones from the war period appear almost identical. And in this case, even to the way he's dressed, he was very close to his uncle. Um, and lots of times on uncles and physical features. A most detailed description of Jones was made at the beachside Fort Lauderdale in 1839 between June 19th and September 9th, published in the Daily Pittsburgh Gazette via the Charleston Courier. Sam is described by a gentleman who had an interview with him thus, of slight elastic frame, six feet high, a mild and benevolent countenance, very small feet, uh, long bony hands, hair nearly all gray, occasionally interrupted with a few black ones, with the ex exception of a dark side. That's pretty detailed. His long gray locks hang down in front of his ears with a beautiful wave amounting almost to a curl. He has a mole on top of his right ear, complexion light, and wears mustachios. The lips project somewhat, teeth sound, but small and worn in the lower jaw. Uh, his voice is very fine and distinct and dresses plain. If you're familiar at all with the pitiful descriptions of Jones put forth in fact, In Cap you now realize the truth corroborated by a grateful perusal of the book. It's fact that Sprague had never even seen Jones. He just made it up. In 1837, General Jessup had commented, we have as little knowledge about the interior of Florida as about the interior of China. In the latter 1840, following Chiquica's success successful raid on Indian Key, off the Florida coast, Harney attached a fleet of Marines for his initial intra Everglades expedition into the uncharted for 
He then found Chiquica, hung him and a dozen other Miccosukee men before they were done. It was thought that he was retaliating for the Caloosahatchee raid by Chiquica that killed his men. It took the Mosquito Fleet deployed in January 1841, the combined fleets of the Navy and Marines under Harney, Powell, and others to thoroughly search the Everglades settlements. They found only huge acreage under cultivation garden. In 2014, Chairman James E. Billy petitioned the state of Florida to formally dedicate State Road 80 that passes through Hendry County, a 20 mile section as Sam Jones Trail. But when Harney and his Marines came through, they found most settlements abandoned and burned with vast acres of crops. At Jones's prophet, Otoki Thako, who carried out Jones's wartime laws and directives, they found some pumpkins and squashes and some hundred acres of palmetto thatch chickies. While Jones Island had 60 to 70 chickies, showing the extent of the town's infrastructure in this area, an area so seeped in the lore of Sam Jones that everyone was calling it the devil's garden and still do today. By this town time, a bounty was put on Bo Jones's capture. In November, 1841, General W.H. Worth promised alligator Halpatatas Ganugi a peace if he could bring in Jones or the prophet and in a letter to Major William G. Belknap, uh, Worth said he would offer Jones himself five to $10,000 and his family could remain in Florida. And so to the second, the second Seminole War was brought to a close August 14th, 1842. The young leader, Billy Bowlegs, involved in the Caloosahatchee raid became the government's ace in the hole taking to Washington, D.C., Boston, New York City to show him the might of America's big cities with the thought that he would be so impressed with the might of the country that he would shun militancy in the future. It didn't work. By 1855, as the government military survey team, and you get this, it was now military survey team, encroached near Boleg settlement in this isolated big Cyprus, he realized that it was just a matter of time before his improvements were jeopardized and he would, too, would be appreciated the Third Seminole War, 1855 to 1858, by firing on the military survey team. And following the Third Seminole War in 1858, Boleg's Alachua people left Florida in the last immigration of 1859. The majority of natives remaining in South Florida were Sam Jones's people and a small percentage of refugee creeks around Okeechobee. As Boleg's speaker, Felsi Hajo had attested in 18 to the basic terms of the Macomb Treaty. It was the only prudent thing he could do. He kept the accord and he, and James, uh, um, I'm sorry, Jones, get, uh, uh, Jones had kept to the accord and it as a document gave him the authority to discipline his own. In this role, he was also consulted by the government to, to Boleg's chagrin. However, without ammunition, Jones's people could no longer take up arms. So he had to wait out the Third Seminole War, assuring as best he could, per the Macomb Agreement, that his Miccosukee people would remain free on the land. This is the headquarters of the Loxahatchee, where Jones headquartered. And by the 1890s, historic Pine Island, uh, west of uh, New River in Fort Lauderdale, was immortalized in postcards. These were people that my family knew when they arrived in North Miami in 1887. And by the early 1920s, Billy Motlow, Tom Billy, and Billy Fuel were the elders, key medicine men and councilmen, the discipliners who were charged with keeping Sam Jones as a laws to the traditional Miccosukee ways. Before the 1950s federal tribalism, the traditional Miccosukee council was judge and jury designating those who would meet out and receive punishment, including the death penalty. 
the wars were over. Sam Jones needed out laws that would be adhered to far into the 20th century. And he passed quietly in his big Cypress settlement in letter 1866 at around 85 years of age. This monument, a statue, another statue, Sam Jones standing Christ-like with the clan totems of the Miccosukee people. It was erected on the Big Cypress Seminole Reservation near where Jones lived and died in his beloved Everglades on the land. Sam Jones town is out in the distance and State Road 33 that runs through Big Cypress Reservation, the Sam Jones Trail is nearby. The windfall of gaming in the latter 20th century was instituted under the young and untried politician who had done two tours of duty in special ops in Vietnam. Seminole Tribal Chairman Bird Clan member James E. Billy would provide the means for tribal economic benefits for all the people, citizens of the Seminole Tribe of Florida and impoverished federally recognized tribes since 1957. In doing so, Billy brought in the new buffalo of improvised reserva two improvised reservations across Indian America, redefining tribal sovereignty. James armed tribal people on federal reservations with capability, no longer poor wards of the government, but tribes in charge of their sovereign rights and dished. On December 7, 2006, on Broadway in New York City, Medicine Man and Rainmaker Bobby Henry and his family celebrate the Seminole Tribe's purchase of the international brand, Hard Rock International, made possible by Billy's economic windfall of gaming. And I thank you very much. What happens now? Patsy? Yes, here? I'm, I'm here. Okay, I just want to thank you very much. That was amazing. I know a lot of us have been here a long time and really didn't realize how much impact the uh, Seminoles had on our, our area. Well, I appreciate, appreciate it. And I'm sorry it was so long and laborious, but it's, it's been a long ride. I'm sure it has, yes. And this was for the people. So, you know, they, they everybody, I think it makes Fort Lauderdale, Hollywood, the Everglades uh, more viable now. Absolutely. There was, um, we really, this is Rhonda. I just wanted, there was hi, one Rhonda. question um, that someone asked if the copies of the maps that were posted are available. Well, there are a lot of maps that are. There are some, one in particular, I'm going to have to have re- it was a family piece that I can't use because it's not my family. Uh, oh, it's, it's too much. It's something that's copyrighted by someone else. Let's put it that way. And so I will have to have it <laughs> remade. The maps are out there in public domain. Oh, okay. The one that shows the land and then the Everglades, that one is the one that, it, that we will have to be rework reworking. Okay. But, so the answer to that is most maps are out there in the public domain. And I really want to impress that this 5,000 square foot exhibition in Miami, at History Miami, it's 100 Flagler Plaza. It can't miss it because it's right next to that courthouse. The tall court heading next year. And I will see that Karen gets all the information on it. But it is a history of the Miccosukee. So it will include this information and tens of thousands more maps. Um, but um, again, it, it places the people within the places that we know so well. And I think that's what's important. Um, where the first port was is right by one of the little bathrooms right there on the beach across from Bahia Mar. I was out here, I would have been there with them because, you know, that's part of my childhood. You know, I mean, um, it's, it's, it's very up close to us. We are walking on that land. And so that's what makes this kind of thing kind of exciting, you know, and for me doing this, of course, it took me 50 years and family money, but still, you know, I'm so glad to have been able to pull it all off. Because the people need to know that. I used to teach school at a Fudgy school out in Big Cypress. 
That's interesting. Seminole history. Well, I'd like another crack at that. On behalf of the friends of the Sterling Road Library as co-host, thank you. It was very interesting. And I'll turn it over to Karen now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I just want to let everyone know that our next lecture is, is uh, the 19th of December. <clears throat> it has been changed. And now we're going to have a, a presentation from the Carpenter House which is down on North Beach. Um, Nova University has their turtle sanctuary there and uh, they will. That it'll be a wonderful presentation. Uh, we're also having a gu um, guided bike tour on December 11 of historical Be Hollywood Beach. Um, that's then we also will be having a downtown walking tour every month until the end of next year, which is a walking tour of the downtown area um, guided by one of our members. They'll be at the same time as the car show. The ha Hammerstein House is also gonna be open now on the first Sunday of every month from one to four. And see our website, Hollywood Historical Society for any other information that you want to know and our webs on our website is a membership form if you'd like to join so i thank everybody for coming we had a wonderful time patsy you were terrific as usual oh. could i could i say something uh karen of course uh hi patsy i'm clive i'm the president of the hollywood hi. store hi i don't I, see where you are hi well because my screen's off my video is not working oh, okay but whenever right. i hear somebody say Miami. I, it, it just like tugs at my background because that, you know, somebody has been in for, you know, South Florida a long time when they pronounce it that way. You would not believe how hard my grandmother worked on me. I told you she was born in 1888 and she beat me over the head with the Miami bit. So finally I realized it, it really was Miami. I am. And they go, Miami, you know, I mean, it was a big I, deal. I, no. you know? No, when well, I hear hi. them, they used to, Miami, that's, I yeah, love Yeah, Miami is home. That. And everybody I give a lecture to, somebody in the audience will come up, <laughs> sometimes even hug me and say, oh, I just loved hearing Miami. You just don't hear it anymore. Well, You've got to keep saying it. I'll come up with something. We'll have it blasted over the <laughs> historical anyway, museums. Miami, Hollywood, Miami. <laughs> right. Thank you. It was great. I really enjoyed it. Talk to you. Yes, thank you. Anybody else? All righty. Well, I, guess, <laughs> I guess that's it again. Thank you everybody okay. for coming and uh, friends of Hollywood of the library can shut us off for now. Okay. okay. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Thank you. Oh yes, thank you everyone too.